delighted now to invite um, President Hoyer and Administrator Steiner to engage with me for a little while on uh, a few questions about the report. Let me ask you, first of all, each of you uh, a, a question just to get us started, perhaps starting with um, Achim Steiner. The 2020 Human Development Report is called The Next Frontier, Human Development and the Anthropocene. What does the report tell us, actually, about this new frontier? We are very humbled and, and uh, excited by the fact that um, you have shown interest in the 2020 Human Development Report and that we have an opportunity to engage with you today on some of the more profound implications that we try to describe and analyze and also present in, in the 2020 report. And at the same time, I think validate what um, Werner and I, I think, have sensed for a, a number of years with many of you as colleagues that in the way that the EIB and UNDP engage in the broader context of a development landscape, but also with many of the countries in which we jointly act, the interpretation of what the future of development looks like, what is likely to drive it, is very central. And so very briefly, in an introductory sense, the 2020 Human Development Report applies, if you want, both a short-term and a longer-term lens, a crisis lens, which is, you know, um, inextricably linked to what is happening around us and happening in the year 2020, COVID-19 disruption. Shireen, you also mentioned it the first time in 30 years of um, measuring human development with the HDI, actually a going backwards. So the profound impact of this crisis, not just in economic terms, but in so many other ways, is indisputable. And I think we're all highly conscious of it. At the same time, we also wanted to apply a longer term and a broader lens. And that is why we drew on this emerging concept of living in the age of the Anthropocene, the, the human age, because for us it encapsulates um, in ways, in many ways, so much of what the science has been telling us, what we're observing in the countries in which we work, where the public, our youth, are debating the choices we need to make. And really, in a nutshell, the Anthropocene is both an expression of this uh, geological phenomenon that we are entering an age in which humans truly are dominant and in the way that we have chosen, particularly in the last 200 years, to exercise this extraordinary technological, intellectual, scientific and economic power has produced extraordinary development gains, but has also taken us um, to the brink on a number of fronts. And understanding that planetary dimension to human development, going back to Amartya Sen, Mabu Bolhak, uh, development as freedom, as opportunity, as capacity, clearly has come to a point where we had to also rethink the Human Development Index. And really what we'll talk about a little bit later is the introduction in 2020 for the first time of something we call an experimental, but nevertheless already quite mature, planetary adjusted Human Development Index. If you recall, the original point of the HDR was to challenge this notion of measuring development through the lens of GDP per capita income alone. Uh, not to discard it, but to broaden it, add uh, education and health into it. And now we are producing for the first time this new adjusted index that takes carbon emissions and the material consumption, the footprint of economies, and try to develop a composite index. Because, And that is really the, the essence of, of this report, is to empower the kind of public debates that allow us to use facts, information, empirical analysis, to inform the sort of choices that we need to make in the midst of a crisis called COVID-19, but also at a moment where I think many of us sense it is a pivot point forward where what happens next will be redefined. And I think that uh, perhaps is the best way to give a brief introduction. The Anthropocene, a new index and the implications it has really for the future of development there for institutions like ours who are really key partners to countries in exercising future choices. Back to you, Sharon. Thank you very much. And of course, the EIB has been doing a lot of thinking itself about development and what that means in the context of the EU Climate Bank. And of course, as you say, in the context of uh, the COVID-19 crisis. So maybe I can ask you, um, President Hoyer, um, from the perspective of the EIB, what does sustainable development in this current climate look like? One that actually does balance people and nature. Thank you very much, Shirin. Thank you very much, uh, Maria. And uh, good to see you, Achim, again. Uh, and uh, before I answer the question, 
let me say that this is really rewarding to see how well our cooperation has developed. Uh, and it's, I think it's, it's, it's a very, very good sign uh, beyond the fact that the EIB in general has uh, in, enlarged and deepened its cooperation with the United Nations Organization over the last years, but in particular with UNDP, it is very, very uh, pleasant and, and fruitful cooperation. So thank you, Arim, for that and to your teams. Um, we have to rely upon our teams when we do things and not just about on our goodwill. So I think it, during the now 50 years that I deal a little bit with development from different perspectives, things have terribly changed, uh, not terribly, have considerably changed. Uh, I remember times when practical, technical questions of development were so much in the foreground that other issues like the human dimension were second ranking. It was at best an emergency measure system that we were thinking about. And nowadays, everybody is aware that sustainable development has at least three components which are indispensable. It's in environment, society, and the economy. And that I would say in that order, not the other way around. Uh, we are committed to well-targeted investments that can assist the green and resilience, resilient transition, but also contribute to human development, ensure a just transition. Sustainable development or a managed transition to a new resource efficient, um, resilient and green economy must happen in a socially inclusive way. Uh, that is why climate action and the just transition need to go hand in hand. This is at the heart of the EIB's mission. By the way, we would not have gotten our new energy lending policy through if we had not thought the other dimension at the same dimension at the same time. We are ready to support a just transition for the most vulnerable groups of society adversely affected by a structural shift away from carbon intensive activities, for, for example. So we are, of course, the EU bank. We implement the policies and priorities of the European Union and with the European Union, as we have seen, for example, with the Team Europe COVID response. Uh, I've, if climate policies leave communities behind, they are most likely to fail. So the EIB has developed its own and new climate bank roadmap that spells out our commitments in this sense, and we are convinced that socially responsive climate actions can strengthen climate and environmental outcomes, or to put it the other way around, if we don't give enough emphasis um, on the uh, socially uh, responsible uh, actions, then we will weaken our climate and environmental objectives and our possibilities to reach them. Thank you. We'll get back into that uh, in a moment, but let me just throw now a uh, brief, and I think we're sort of, you know, enter a bit more of a dialogue. So both of you do feel free to jump in where you want and don't be too polite uh, <laughs> waiting for me to ask the question. But Clearly, uh, if I could ask you, um, Akin Steiner, there's a lot of synergy there. Um, there always was, I guess that's why we're close partners. But what in this report, going back to the report and, it, and its specific recommendations, do you think is important for IFIs like the uh, European Investment Bank and other international finance partners to know about? What would you pick out as the, the key things? Well, to pick up... Uh... When Ahoya left off just now, I think it is not in the basics of um, that understanding of sustainable development. I think we are all living in an age where we have begun to realize that social and planetary imbalances, if I may refer to them for a moment like this, are really two sides of the same coin and that um, they reinforce each other. So investments, regulations, policies that are blind to one or the other will ultimately run the risk of failure. Nobody understands that better than an institution that works as a financing institution. And yet, um, we also know that the European Investment Bank and that, let's say, the international financial institutions um, that play a significant role in this development landscape also have a vital role to play in um, being able to address this lifeblood in our economies, which is financing, without which we cannot recover from the crisis, we cannot even manage to cope 
with the crisis and we know how difficult um, a fiscal space scenario we are confronted with right now, including with the mounting debt um, challenge that lies ahead of us. So financing becomes a key platform which transactions between a moment in time and options for the future are essentially shaped. And I think the EIB, and as Vanna just said, and really you are the EU climate bank now with that commitment of a trillion euros with the tradition that you began in, I think it was 2007, 2008 with green bonds. I mean, these are um, institutional initiatives, signals that you send, uh, first of all, into the financial markets, but that you also, um, in by virtue of engaging with countries, create access to more options, better choices, more informed choices. And, you know, we have a critical role to play because we have, to some degree, an inertia in the economies of today. I mean, to some, they function very well. Uh, capital markets, financial institutions, yes, are often very good at detecting risk, but they're not necessarily very good at detecting the next frontier or investing in it. So what does an EIB um, and a UNDP working together in support of a country's choices that it wishes to make bring to the equation? Well, I think one, it's, it's um, you know, progressive capital, capital that can be invested not just to build the next power station, the next infrastructure, um, but actually to leverage the investment in terms of evolving an economy's, you know, future capacity, readiness for a future economy, to um, de-risk, to catalyze, to also, um, let's say, help a government accelerate transitions within its own economy. And here the EIB has a, a critical, um, you know, role to play also because of its engagement with that wide universe of the private sector. Uh, UNDP traditionally has been an institution focused on public policy. I think in the last 10, 15 years, clearly the understanding of the private sector of markets, including the financial markets, has risen significantly on our own radar. And yet we are not a lending institution, but we are an institution that working hand in hand with um, EIB, for instance, can help a government address the regulatory framework. And this is where the Human Development Report very clearly um, focuses and homes in on the role of finance on incentives, on distortions, on market distortions that have essentially locked in countries investing today's money in yesterday's economy. And so I think from the way that we move forward here, the, you know, just taking the issue of carbon pricing, it's a policy, it's a regulatory measure on the one hand, but it's actually a deeply market-oriented um, intervention to address a distortion. How do we enable um, not just large business, but also small, medium-scale enterprises that constitute in most economies well over 90% of business, how are we able to help governments to also reach them? Because they are the vast majority of millions of everyday decisions that are taken by entrepreneurs. So I think um, this, is, this is the kind of lens that I would bring to uh, interpreting the ability to think together, but then also to work hand in hand as partners to countries. This is what will ultimately allow us to come out of this crisis not by defaulting back to where we were. And we all know, and people deeply uh, desire leadership at the moment. But it's very difficult for a country to lead with bold investments in the future if it has no money, no resources, and lacks the complex policy, regulatory, and financial means by which to make that kind of choice possible. So that's where I, I think we, we truly, both in the report, but also in the, in the growing partnerships that we're developing, I think are learning every day. And uh, Maria mentioned earlier on our uh, joint analysis and partnership on a report on COVID-19 and digital uh, frontiers on the African continent in response to COVID-19. Learning together saves a lot of money, time and energy, and is ultimately for the countries also extremely beneficial. Back to you, Sharon. Thank you. I, I mean, a lot to come back on there uh, for you, President. Um, maybe we can, I mean, obviously on what you want, but maybe we can particularly handle the the issue of incentivizing, which is obviously something that comes out of the report very strongly. Actually, even though uh, we're not coming to the Q&A from the audience uh, until later, there is a question about that too from the audience. You know, what are we doing to incentivize um, clean energy? But also we are talking about um, investment in clean energy. We're talking about biodiversity and adaptation. 
which are traditionally areas that are difficult sometimes to get the investment into. Uh, they're areas where our new climate bank roadmap for the EIB um, is, is, is uh, putting that much more center stage. So what could you tell us, uh, President Hoyer, about what the bank can do to incentivize these kinds of priorities? Well, first of all, we need reports like the one we are talking about here today, because we need eye openers. And from that point of view, it is extremely important uh, to, to see the link between human development and the protection of nature and, and biodiversity, uh, to understand the link between humans and environment, uh, because uh, that leads us to the recognition of the sustainable development goals as a as a concept, a comprehensive concept, and not just a selection between individual SDGs. Uh, if the pursuit of an SDG leads to the to the detrimental effect on other SDGs, we are making mistakes. So we have to um, arrive at some uh, comprehens comprehensive thinking here, uh, also when it comes to uh, the necessity to convince all players to take action as the UNDP uh, Human Development Reports asks us to do. For us, that means in particular that we have changed over the last, let's say, decade, uh, in particular, strongly and consequently from volume thinking, which is not unusual for a bank, to impact thinking. What really, we really try to, to, to focus on and measure is impact. And uh, I think that is uh, uh, the, basis, uh, the basic recognition also for our insistence on tracking our contributions to the SDGs. Uh, since 2016, and we report that regularly in, in our statements. And uh, since uh, 2020, we have stepped up uh, with a strengthened methodology, which is also helping the approach we have together with other MDBs. So there is serious pro progress there. I'd like to say a word on the uh, mentioning of the private sector. I think it is indeed absolutely illusionary to believe we would really make substantial progress towards the achieving of the sustainable development goals if we believe it can be done by, by public money alone, by taxpayers' money. Uh, we see the, for instance, in the urgent uh, increase needs for innovation investments in, in Europe, not in just in development, in, in, only in Europe alone, 85% of that, of that must come from the private sector. And we must give incentives to go there. We go do that via the uh, attractiveness of the project we pursue. On the other hand, we do it also via the funding schemes. And that's an interesting point also for, I think, for, for development. When we were the avant-garde or the first issue of green bonds in 2007, that was a lunatic idea at that point. This lunatic idea is now worth a trillion euros. So uh, there is a big success in it. We are still, I think, the, the biggest multilateral issue of, of green bonds. But then it took the necessity to make these investments safe by avoiding greenwashing and by making sure that something that is painted green also contains green. And that then led to the interesting recognition that what we have successfully rolled out for environmental investments funding can work for other SDGs as well. And that's what we're presently doing. We have rolled out the sustainability awareness bonds and we put uh, emphasis on uh, special bonds in the pursuit of other SDGs like health, education, and water quality. And I think uh, if we have a, a comprehensive look at these issues, I think we can, we can um, we can achieve more. Now, how do we get the private sector in? Well, convince them that, uh, as Achim just said, uh, putting today's money into, to, into yesterday's business is not a very good idea. Show that the future, uh, the tomorrow's business, uh, can be the much more attractive way to be successful as an entrepreneur via innovation and technology. And this is why I always see the link between innovation 
climate and development. Some people think these is, things can be these three strands can be separated or looked at separately. No, they cannot. We will be successful only in development, which definitely needs quantum leaps in development in some countries, some regions of this world. Only if we put innovation into the service of climate action and development. Thank you, President, uh, President Hoyer. Um, the, your report, um, Administrator Steiner, uh, does specifically call for a major transformation of our economies. Now, you've touched on this a little, but I wonder if you can go into it in a bit more depth. Um, what's the role of international finance, do you think, in that transformation uh, beyond uh, the incentivizing that you've talked about? Well, I, I probably can't beat Werner Hoyer's summary just now. I think you already, Werner, laid out the significant interfaces between an international financial institution, the countries, and the economies into which you uh, lend money. And I think this is critical. But I also want to acknowledge very much um, your emphasis on the SDGs. And I think that they matter at the moment. Because the first thing that we need right now is a clear sense of the direction, the, the, the map on which we move forward through this very chaotic moment and disruptive moment. And I think I've often described the SDGs as really, uh, when you turn them on their head, being a, a risk map of the 21st century. So into this complexity, into this systemic set of challenges, come uh, both opportunities, but also need to set priorities to make choices. This is where metrics matter, and Dana already spoke to it just now, and I think the Human Development Index, again, is trying to provide, if you want, a compass um, within this series of complex choices, the need to prioritize, often very uncomfortable prioritization in the midst of this crisis. Do you save a national airline, or do you save a, a million small, medium-scale enterprise or informal sector jobs? You can't do both, so you have to make choices. And I think in the way that we think about the future of our economies, I always go back to first principles. If you listen carefully, and you know, the 2019 report, Human Development Report, homed in on inequality, you will remember uh, beyond income, beyond averages, beyond today. Um, I think there are two fundamental variables that define both the viability and the success of our economies into the future. They center on this issue of equity, which has exploded in rich and poor nations equally in recent years, with that sense that also goes to the core of governance and government. If citizens lose their trust and confidence that governments can transact a economy, a society, a governance system that is fair and just, let's just start with those basic principles, gilet jaune, or you know, the events in Chile, or in Hong Kong, or in New York, for that matter, I think they clearly point to a central part of the um, paradigm, the, the, the normative, and that's why we also um, in the report highlight that however soft it may sound to some, social norms will be fundamental to societies being able to move forward, cohesion rather than polarization. And equity, inequality, uh, alongside you know, remaining poverty are critical to address here. They are reflected in COVID-19. You know, 50% of the world without social protection. In many developing economies, 80 to 90% of people earning their livelihoods in the informal sector. You shut down the economy, you've essentially closed down their economy. And, um, you know, in the sense of lockdowns, we have learned a lot. And it is one reason why we put forward, you know, you may recall last year uh, in about August, I think it was, this um, document looking at temporary basic incomes as a way of trying to connect the crisis to the fiscal space challenge to the issue of debt and perhaps finding a uh, debt suspension modality that would allow governments to do the right thing at that moment, which is to help people stay alive in a sensible response to COVID-19. So the second part clearly is the sustainability trajectory, and they are inextricably linked, as Werner Hoyer also pointed out. And I think the international financial institutions are a critical part of that frontier of experimentation and, um, you know, angel investor capital almost that allows those parts of an economy that are ready to embrace, to move forward, to invest in a future economy, to move faster and not to be penalized by the financial markets that treat them as higher risk and by governments that do not recognize that regulatory uh, frameworks may actually be punitive and discourage them from moving in the right direction. Look at the story of 
renewable energy in recent years. So I think the economies that we are looking um, towards the next 10 to 20 years as driving successful human development clearly are located in trying to address the issue of climate change, decarbonization, but also resilience. Investing in nature, Shirin, you made that point in one of your questions earlier on. Yes, financial markets you know, have not been very smart in being able to leverage that ecological infrastructure that is so fundamental to what happens next uh, in our economies in a way that um, allows investment to happen as, you know, with more traditional infrastructure. But I often use that term ecological infrastructure because it is actually the equivalent of the built up environment in sustaining our economy. So again, can uh, a European investment bank be a pioneer in the way that it launched green bonds and, and many other instruments to mature a market that naturally is not moving fast enough? And this is, I think, a key role. We need our public development institutions to be accelerators because the time window is getting so narrow. And mm -hmm. it is one reason why in UNDP we also developed this SDG impact um, investment platform to try and bring some clarity and transparency on the issue of impact when you raise bonds and equities. Hopefully something that we can work closely together with the EIB because we already benefited from a lot of input from your experts. Back to you. Thank you. Um, I, just a very brief then, uh, quick last question to President Hoyer, because I know you both uh, can't stay with us for too much longer, but we're delighted so far to have had you. But I do want to come back to that phrase. It's very a very nice one, the ecological infrastructure. Uh, and uh, maybe just reflect a minute uh, on what that actually means in the context of the idea of an inclusive, and just transition, which is, of course, at the heart of the report, but very much part of the EIB and the EU strategy, just transition applying, of course, to coal dependent communities, but perhaps also to uh, communities in the Amazon who rely on the forest for their livelihoods uh, or who for whom intensive agriculture may be also presenting new challenges. Does the EIB have this on its radar? as well as uh, the cohesion and the, and the coal dependent communities as well, President Hoyer? I dare to say clearly, yes. We have been learning and we needed to learn. There were times when we were so proud of our contribution to reaching climate objectives that we narrowed this to climate action and did not see the need to open up towards this overall globe of, for instance, biodiversity, and what that means for, for humans to exist. So from that point of view, I think we have begun to understand what is crucial. By the way, when we talk about the private sector there and private investors, I suggest we give them the benefit of the doubt. Because I must really say that when I go to investors conference, I'm sometimes really impressed how open-minded many investors are when it comes to, for instance, funding of biodiversity projects. And, and we'll have the big conference in this, this fall in, in China. And I hope there will be great progress in this respect. For us, for instance, it is clear that when we de develop our funding projects, which we began with the green bonds 14 years ago, we are putting the biodiversity at the same level as uh, classical climate adaptation or mitigation projects. So I think we are on the on the right track there. What is what is important here more than anywhere else is that we organize that we go for the trust and confidence of the markets by clinging to principles like transparency, accountability, and clean reporting. Because only then we will have the, success, the support of the private sector, which will be indispensable for, um, for going into this direction. And this requires then indeed something like the, the taxonomy, which the European Union is working on, and uh, I believe it is really a trust building exercise and should not be seen as a bureaucratic mo monster at the first place. 